Good morning. Would you please stand with me as we come to worship our Lord and Savior? as family. It's good together to worship and to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come into your house, we come in with so many things going on in our world. So many of our friends and family that are ill or recovering or dealing with some physical issue. So many of our family who are traveling so many of our family who are grieving. So many of our family who are rejoicing. Lord, we come with the full range of human emotion this morning. We come in the full range of fears and concerns, hopes, joys. And Lord, we just come to you to worship. We come to you to recognize that we are not alone that you've never left us, you've never forsaken us, that you are walking alongside us, that every community of faith in every church around the world that serves you are our brothers and our sisters whom we can call on as well. Lord, I pray that you would minister to your people this morning. As we have come into this place, 
It is no more sacred than any other of the places where people gather. But Lord, you've said that where two or more are gathered together, you are there in the midst of them. And so we acknowledge your presence this morning. We acknowledge your strength. We acknowledge your peace and your endurance. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for every life that you have placed around us. Those who you have given us opportunity to minister to. Those who minister to us. I thank you, Lord God, for this time and this place as we gather together to sing, to give, to receive, to open your word. Lord, that in all things, we honor you. We thank you. We give you the glory and the honor and the thanksgiving that you are due. Lord, I pray this morning that you would work through Rudy and the praise team that, Lord, their time of preparation would truly lead us into worship this morning. Lord, we're not presenting. We're not performing. We're just here. We're your children with our feet stuck up under your table, gathered around in the homestead, looking so forward to seeing you face to face and wanting to have the fellowship and the interaction with you that you also desire. Lord, we acknowledge your presence with us. We acknowledge that you are faithful to your word and that we can place our trust in you. When things seem beyond our abilities, when things seem beyond our understanding, when themes, things seem completely chaotic and we wonder, God, where are you? Let us hear that still, small voice that whispers in our ear as your arms wrap around us and you console us that you are here in the midst of this. All of the pain, all of the joy, all that we face, you face with us. Remind us, Lord God, of your face laughing around a campfire with 12 guys you called disciples. Remind us, Lord God, of the love from the cross that said, forgive them, they know not what they do. Remind us, Lord God, of the face of our Master standing at the tomb of His friend, knowing full well that at the end of that day, Lazarus would sit around a table with family again and yet in that moment stood in that field and openly wept feeling our pain knowing our frustration enduring what we endure standing with us truly Lord God you are Emmanuel God with us and I pray, Lord God, that you would convince us of your presence, overwhelm us with your spirit, use us for your glory, and love us as only you can. And we'll thank you for it as we give you praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning again. You'll have to forgive me this morning if I have to stand here and kind of look down at the words now and then we don't have them on the back screen this morning so bear with us while we when we sing and, and lead in worship join us please great and mighty is the lord our god great and mighty is the lord our god great and mighty is he great and mighty is the lord our god Great and mighty is He. Lift your banners, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift 
Raise your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Amen. It is good to be here this morning. Things have not, you know, been all the, uh, all in tune this morning and all running in exact order or anything. But, you know, we talked about it before service started. We were up here. And Pastor Mark was up here. And somehow or another, ages and ages and ages ago, we used to do all this without the screens, without microphones, and all that good stuff. And we managed to worship. The biggest hue and cry back then that I recall was everybody had a hymnal. And the music leader or the choir director would always say, lift your book up and look up so they can hear you singing. Instead, everybody would always stand there and go like this. Well, yeah, and I can understand it. But we can still worship. We can still raise our voices to our Savior. So let's do that this morning. Glorify thy name. Sing his name is wonderful. And I'd like, if you like to, if you want to, just sit and take this time while we're singing to not only sing, but to contemplate, prepare your hearts for a special time in each worship service. <clears throat> Master of everything, 
to a place that the pastor took us to yesterday. Uh, I love to tell the story, and I love to tell this story. Uh, this is one of my favorite characters, not because I completely identify with her, but my heart does. So I want to go back to John, to the story of the woman caught in adultery, and I want to take it one step further, so bear with me as I tell a story. We know that what Jesus said to her, we know, we know what he said, but I'm sure there were other things that were spoken to this woman. But we do know that he said, woman, where are those that accuse you? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. Not a dry eye there. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared to her, go and leave your life of sin or as in some versions go and sin no more now i want you to just wrap your head around this woman and i'm not talking about the others who accused her i'm not talking about uh what their part of this was and how god spoke to them i just want to talk about a woman jesus sent her back to her community how do you go back when everybody knows you as a whore? How do you go back when everybody knows you as a sinner who sells her body to stay alive? Or if she is um, high up in that echelon, that uh, she has to face the very ones that condemned her. She has to face the community, the women, the outstanding good women of the community who whisper behind her back, the merchants who don't want to deal with her so that they're not associated with her. How do you go back to that? Everybody knew who she was and what she was. She had to change. She had to change her jobs, change her life, change her dress style, change her friends, her language, change her attitude, and change her environment. She faced rejection, possible poverty, abandonment, hostility, judgment, gossip, loneliness, shame, guilt, condemnation, stares, and fear. She had nothing left to what she was because he said, go and sin no more. But... She faced it with the power of Christ in her life. 
she faced it with love because he loved her and clothed her in his grace. She faced forgiveness of what she had done and how she had thrown her life away, perhaps forced into it, perhaps not. She faced loneliness with Christ. She faced it with grace and mercy and hope of her Savior, Jesus Christ. If this story was written today, we would say that the Holy Spirit cleaned her up and lived inside her, and she had the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not written like that, but you know what? She had the Spirit of God in her because she met Jesus face to face. She saw the look he gave her. He gave her worth. He gave her hope. He gave her grace. He gave her a blessing and a second chance. That's the woman that I want to talk about today. The redeemed woman. She goes back to the village and what does she do? I would like to think that those that belong to the body of Christ saw her in a new eye heard her with a new understanding and saw Christ in her and wrapped themselves around her and took her in as one of their own. God not only saved her, he brought her into a new understanding and a new home. So in that respect, we as the body of Christ must see people redeemed, saved, struggling, fearful, lonely, maybe abandoned, or maybe brand new already and strong to stand. But they're our family. They're our family now. And that requires us to forgive, to love, to teach, to discipline in love, and to accept. Do you see why I love her so much? Because she had to face everything. But she faced it with God. It is his story. I love to tell his story of redemption. And every one of these characters in here have a story. And so do we. We need to share it. We need to take pride not in who we are or were, but in who loved us enough that went after the one to bring us together. I thank him for that. Gentlemen, please come down. We are going to celebrate our redemption by remembering to accept and receive the, the implements that are presented to you today, thanking him with a grateful heart. I don't know what walk of life you came from, and I'm not telling you the walk of life I came from right now. But it was not obedience. It was knowledge. It was understanding. It was a, a Christian home until I got on my own. And then we do crazy things. But the blood of Jesus washed and made himself very clear to me and to you, or you wouldn't still be here. You'd find other things to do with your time. And the body that was broken for me became my symbol of life. So we're going to bow our heads and pray over our moment here where we thank the Lord for what he has done. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Lord has given you extra moments today to be still and know that he is God, to glorify his name.
to ask for your needs and lay out your petitions before him to thank him for his greatness and his mercy and his mightiness. The Lord has given us a chance to feel his spirit move and to respond. Thank you for your opportunity, Father God, for us to quiet our minds and in doing so be prepared for what is coming, for the word spoken to us that we might speak to others with the same clarity and the same grace and mercy that you have shown us. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to praise you in offertory, in tithe. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be and make a difference in this world. We bless you, God, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Lyman. You ever notice life is sometimes tough? Huh. I hope this morning, by the time we finish our, co our conversation, that you see the faithfulness of God with you. My mother is recovering from eye surgery. Sandy is recovering from eye surgery, and then she and Fred had to go do something. And so suddenly, Rudy was dumped this week with, oh great, we're a cappella. Because in response to all that's going on in our community, Lyman has faithfully said, you know what? I owe more to Betty than I do anyone else, so I'm going to hide out for a while and protect her. And I said, praise God, which is why you hadn't seen him in two weeks. But he hears wind that the girls are out, and so makes himself available. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Guys, that kind of stuff goes on in this building all the time. So many of you step up in all of those moments where it's like, oh, I, I can do that. And you just make it happen. And I just commend you before God. I commend you before our Savior that you guys are so faithful. Because life's tough. No lie. Spoiler alert. Life's tough. And we sometimes are challenged in our faith how in the world can this be part of the plan? How in the world can what I'm enduring right now actually be the grace of God in my life? How is this possible that I'm enduring this pressure, this stress, this pain, this whatever, and that this is... God with me? I mean, if I were God, I would run things differently. How many would agree with me? <laughs> this is not the way I would run a planet. Praise God, He doesn't run it like we would. <laughs> Praise God that He does not succumb to the foibles of of thinking of self. As we come to this next passage in Exodus, we'll be beginning in chapter 4 and verse 18. But let's set this back up again of what's gone on in these opening chapters. God has called Moses, prepared Moses, raised Moses to go to Egypt. The entirety of the nation of Israel is waiting on the redemption of God and he is working in the life of one man. So where is he for the rest of the people? <laughs> right there with them 
in the midst of slavery. Right there with them. Providing for them in ways they don't even acknowledge. They don't even see. And God has called Moses to go to Egypt and demand the Israelites release in the name of Yahweh. And if, if my using God's biblical name is offensive to you, I apologize. There are several faith groups that you might be listening today. And you're, like, Ooh, you're not supposed to speak the name of God. I know. I understand that you may have been taught that. I mean no offense. But I think it's so imperative that we understand that God gave us that name by which through all generations we were to call Him by. And so as I read this this morning, where the Bible has stuck in the word LORD in all caps, what's really going on there is the name of God. And it's important when you're talking to a Pharaoh who worships a pantheon of Egyptian gods, the name becomes important. And so as I read this morning, I will use that name. Moses had been given signs and wonders in addition to words. I mean, can you, can you stop and think about this for a second? No time did God look at Moses and say, go save my people. You realize what he's done so far. He said, you're going to go here, and then you're going to go there, and then this is going to happen, and then you're going to do this, and oh, by the way, here's how you turn your hand into a leprosy, and here's how you turn your stick into a snake, and here's how you do all these other, that will convince people that you're actually working for me. God's completely set him up. All he's got to do is follow directions. Put tab A in slot B. That's all he's got to do. Go to Pharaoh. Speak to him. Show him these signs and wonders. And God has told Moses right here at the outset in the opening three or four chapters, Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. Have you ever had one of those situations where you knew you needed to go talk to somebody that you were real nervous about going and talking to them and you're preparing and you're getting all of your stuff together and you get in and you're like, here, I've got this idea and the boss looks up and goes, yeah, go ahead. Wait, you were supposed to make me work for this. Have you ever had the opposite where you went to a friend that you knew was on board, you saw eye to eye, everything was just going to fall into place and they went, no. But, you see, Moses isn't even set up for failure here. Moses is set up for success. God says, you're going to go. You're going to say, let them go. And Pharaoh's going to say, no. Then why are you sending me? Because I'm going to spank him. But he has to be dumb before I can do that. So I'm going to let him be dumb. Matter of fact, for a little while, I'm going to help him be dumb. And that's the plan. And when it's all said and done, you guys will be gone, and he won't bother you anymore, and I will have redeemed you. So just follow the plan. Moses has been told that Pharaoh will not comply and that God will use this to his own purposes. Moses has been given a helpmate, a paraclete, one who will walk alongside him, and it gets to be his brother Aaron. How cool is that? You know, 40 years in the palace, how often did he get to hang out with his bro? Probably not much. He runs away. 40 years he's in the other land, hanging out with the sheep. How often does he get to see his brother? Probably not much. Seeing his brother's a slave in Egypt. So now all of a sudden, he gets to hang out with his brother. For the next 40 years, they get to make up for lost time. They get to hang out with each other. And they get to work together. And as we closed out last week, the well, first few verses of chapter 4, Moses has angered God by his hesitancy, by his excuse-mongering, here, God has said, here's exactly the way the plan is going to work out. And Moses is like, I don't know. 
Seriously? Um, check resume. Hiding out non-shepherd wannabe palace boy versus king of kings and creator of the universe. Who can plan better? Hmm. Dude, seriously? I've chosen you, I've picked you, I've trained you, I've placed you, I've taught you, I've, I'm going to give you, I'm providing for you, I'm going to use everything. Send somebody else. Fine, I will send somebody else with you. You're still going. You and Aaron, make it happen. So, Moses is already demonstrating that he is a man who needs continued work. Um, to help you know what that looks like, I would suggest looking in a mirror. This is a guy that needs work, and I'm assuming most of you aren't perfect yet either. So Moses is a guy who's got some serious character flaws, one of which, by the time we get to the end of Exodus, will actually keep him from going into the promised land. And yet, God's going to use him. God's going to bless him. God's going to minister through him. God's going to deliver his people through this nutcase. Just like he will through this one. God uses the simple things to confound the wise. God's got a plan to use Moses, and he's going to use Moses in an incredible way. And while he's doing it, he's going to redeem his people as he fixes Moses. Join me in Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Then, immediately following the whole burning bush scene, just to put us back in perspective... So God has just talked to Moses out of the bush. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go. <laughs> I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said, I'm sorry, Yahweh said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is yet what Yahweh says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refused to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place along the way, Yahweh met Moses and was about to kill him. Ah! What? But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So Yahweh let him alone. At that time she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Yahweh said to Aaron, go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything Yahweh had said to him and sent him to say. And also about all the miracle, miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites. And Aaron told them everything Yahweh had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh? That I should obey him and let Israel go. I don't know Yahweh. And I will not let Israel go. 
Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert in order to offer sacrifices to Yahweh, our God. Or he may strike us with plagues or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses, Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They're lazy. That's why they're crying out, Now let's go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. And the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? And the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we're told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten. But the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh says, lazy! That's what you are. You're lazy. That's why you keep saying, now let's go and sacrifice to Yahweh. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Understatement of the year, verse 19. The Israelite foremen realized they were in trouble. When they were told, you will not reduce the number of bricks required each day. And when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may Yahweh look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Oh Lord, Yahweh, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. You see, as we look at this passage of Scripture, things get really dark. You know, Moses is obedient, reticent, but obedient. He goes back to Jethro, goes back to say goodbye to father-in-law. Well, that's not just like, hey guys, been nice. Thanks for all the fish. Out of here. No, he is living under his father-in-law's roof. He is part of a family system where he is not the head. Jethro is. And so he goes to his father-in-law and says, May I leave? And Jethro's like, dude, go home. Go check on your people. Go with my blessing. So he's given this opportunity. And the Bible says that he takes his family and that he takes his staff as God told him to. He knows why he's going back. Now think about it. If you were about to go get in a fist fight with Pharaoh, would you take the family? something to be said about the Moses faith that's already beginning to develop. If God can make a burning bush that doesn't burn, but uh, and he can make the stick, and you, pretty sure he's got them okay. So he brings Zipporah and the family along. And God again shares with Moses the plan. And this time he actually reveals a part of how that plan is going to end. 
He says, go and demand a release. But he's going to refuse. And I will kill Pharaoh's firstborn for defying me. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody who thinks God is okay with a specific thing or and it's not he doesn't really care, right? I mean, you can say no to God. He's gracious. He's merciful. You, you can give God the finger. It's okay. No, I'm going to kill your firstborn for your disobedience. Whoa! You see, there is a righteousness and a holiness about God that says, I have asked you to give me my firstborn son. Let him come and worship me. But you are going to deny me my rights as God. Fine. I will remind you who is the creator and who is the creature. That seems harsh to us because we want mercy for ourselves and justice on our enemies. God doesn't care whose friend or enemy. God is all about justice. And in His justice offers us grace and mercy. Do not ever think you got off scot-free. Jesus paid it all. God's righteousness and God's justice were met at the cross so that He can offer mercy and grace. But Pharaoh doesn't have a Savior. Pharaoh has been abusing God's people. Pharaoh has set himself other gods. Pharaoh has said, I don't even know this dude, even when you give me his name. Get out of my courtroom. Oh, well, evidently you need an introduction. Let me introduce myself. Now, he won't take Pharaoh's firstborn until we're much, much further into the book. But already... We get to glimpse, God knows how this is going to play out. God knows what's going to happen in the end. Moses, this is how this is going to go down. Think about it, friends. How many of you would sacrifice your firstborn? Funny, not seeing a lot of hands. God's helping us and Moses understand, look... Pharaoh is going to risk everything to say no. Pharaoh is going to get so principled, he's going to get so self-serving, he's going to get so self-righteous that he, even in the face of miracle after miracle after miracle that proves his entire thought process wrong and that he is facing what is a real God with real consequences will still say no. And he'll pay for it. God also demands that same holiness of his new leader. You see, just about the time we would recoil and go, ooh, angry God, probably need to be somewhere else. Whew, glad I'm not Pharaoh. The very next verse, who is God going after? Moses. Why? Because Moses has failed in his righteousness. He has failed to circumcise his son. He has failed to follow what is evidently a directive. Now, we don't have anything in Genesis or Exodus up to this point that says thou shalt circumcise their children and we're still chapters away from the law. So it's not like the formal law has been given. He, Moses doesn't have Leviticus to work with. He doesn't know this stuff yet. But evidently, just as the same evidence is given to us with Cain and Abel that they were supposed to bring sacrifices, God wouldn't be angry with Moses for not fulfilling a righteous act unless Moses knew he was supposed to have this righteous act. 
And he's failed to do it. So here is a guy that has already stood in God's presence and went, no, send somebody else. Oh, and by the way, I'm not following your dumb rule either. Now, we don't know why Moses hadn't circumcised his son. We don't even know which son. You know, we've been told that he had Gershom, but as we started reading this section, he took Zipporah and his sons. He got more than one at this point. We don't even know which of the boys he hadn't circumcised, but one of his sons, he failed to follow God. And so God was after him. And I think it's fascinating that Zipporah, the daughter of the priest of Midian, sees what Moses does not. She's the one that recognizes the spiritual reality that they're living under and the threat that's going on there. And she's the one that takes action. Moses is just like, why is God mad at me? Why is he picking on me? I don't get it. And Zipporah's like, you idiot. And she walks over and she circumcises the boy and she takes the foreskin and she throws it at Moses' feet. This is the ancient Near Eastern form of the word, duh! I've paid for my bridegroom with the blood of my son. I've had to redeem you, you idiot. You're now a bridegroom of blood to me. Will you please start paying attention? I am not going to ask husbands and wives to raise their hands and how many times you've looked at your spouse and went, are you listening? This is exactly what Zipporah is doing to Moses. Dude, you have seen God face to face in a burning bush. He has given you miracles. He has given you direction. He has sold you. All you got to do is put slab A in slot B and you're going, I don't know. I think I could reconstruct the box a different way. Zipporah becomes the hero for the story of Israel. Think about this. If God had taken Moses out, how much longer would it have been before the redemption of the people? Because he still would have redeemed the people. Fascinating, isn't it? That a daughter of the priest of Midian plays a part in redeeming Israel. In any case... Moses appears and informs the Israeli leadership and they accept and they believe and they worship. I mean, can you imagine being in slavery for 400 years and somebody coming up and going, hey, you know the God that you serve? He cares and you're out of here. This is a limited time basis. Uh, yes! Serious world-class party time. So they worship God. They give Him all adoration. They give Him all of their praise. And they spend time adoring Him. And then chapter 5. Talk about being hit with a ton of bricks. The children of Israel are told, no, 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 you can't make brick with the straw that's provided anymore. You're not going to have straw provided anymore. You're still going to make all the bricks, but you don't get all the ingredients. Now, this doesn't make sense necessarily unless you understand how bricks are made. When you're making concrete, when you're making things out of wet down rock, you've got to have something that holds it all together. And you've got to have something that gets held together. And so in the ancient Near East, if you're going to turn sand into bricks, if you're going to turn dirt into bricks, you need some coagulant. We make concrete today, we throw in little pebbles. There's not a whole lot of pebbles. So they were using straw. Mickey, if you will. This is an image of me in Iraq, not Egypt. Let's be clear. I'm in Iraq. I'm actually standing in the birthplace of Abraham. This is in Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, when, when God calls Abraham, and we'll, we, we've already dealt with that in Genesis, but I'm holding an ancient Near Eastern brick. Because I found it on the ground, and I thought, oh, how cool, get a picture of this. 
I wanted you to see what a brick looked like. Now, this is an Iraqi brick, a Babylonian brick. But I don't think the Babylonians made them entirely different from the Egyptians. And it was one of those aha moments when I was walking through Ur because I saw this brick and I picked it up and I had my chaplain assistant with me. I was like, dude, take a picture. So I turned it so that you could see the top. And I was like, wait, you can't tell how thick it is. Next picture. It's that thick. So that you can see. Okay, so you can see the brick's about that thick and about that big square. So you, you get the brick. But check this out. Next picture. This brick is about 2,400 years old. What's in the middle of it? Can you see the straw? They took straw and mixed it with the mud and then baked the brick. I tell you what, when I was in Ur and I saw this brick the first time I did a happy dance, my chaplain assistant is like, he needs water. Something wrong with him. I'm like, no, 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 no. Exodus. He's like, dude, Exodus took place in Egypt. We're in Babylon. Look at the brick. There's straw in the brick. So, so what? Don't you get it? All those voices in the world going, you know, you really can't trust the Bible. It's not historically accurate. You put straw in the brick. You put straw in the brick. Really? There's straw in the brick. Except now Pharaoh says, no, you don't get to do that. Thank you. We're not going to provide that. And so suddenly God, wait a minute, guys. What did God say at the outset? <laughs> I'm going to send you and they're going to say no. You see, everybody understood the plan, but nobody thought through the logistics. What does it mean for the Pharaoh to say no? You really think it was going to be that easy? You've got a rebel who in years past used to live in the palace who's disappeared for 40 years who comes stomping back in out of the desert and suddenly says, let this people go that we've got as slavery. Who do you think you are and what would that do to my economy? Yeah, he's just going to go, oh, this will just go away. We'll ignore it. Mm -mm. Pharaoh is a politician. He understands how to keep his job. So he's going to make an example out of this one. Now, as we go through these chapter, this chapter and a half here, this isn't just the span of a verse or two. We're talking about days and weeks of him going and saying, Pharaoh, you need to let my people go. No. Okay, fine. And, and then we'll, and then, Pharaoh, you need to let my people go. Nope, not going to do it. No, we're not going to do the straw. And, and well, how long is it not going to do the straw? And, well, we'll do the straw for thing for a couple of days. And now, wait a minute. We're getting beat because we're not getting, how many days did it take before they started to not meet the quota, before they used up all the, so this is not a short story. This has been taking days, weeks, maybe even months. This is a battle between the will of Pharaoh and the will of God. The will of man and the will of God. Now, I want to defend what God is doing at this point, not because he needs my defense, but just to get us out of the stupid way that we sometimes think. The people are not pawns in some game God is playing because God is not playing. He has demanded of man to obey and mankind is disobeying and he will hold them accountable. He's not playing. These people are not being used as pawns because Pharaoh doesn't care about them and God will give everything for them. We have to remember we're not pawns in some game God is playing because he's not playing. But Pharaoh, on the other hand, doesn't mind taking out his wrath on the people. He doesn't know the God, but he knows these idiots. And so let's get us some. And he begins to abuse these people even worse than they were treated. What did it say back in chapters 2 and 3? Ruthlessly. 
He's already been worse than any slave driver you've ever seen pictures of from the Civil War. He's already doing... There's nobody checking what he's doing. He can kill off the entire generation of baby boys and nobody blinks an eye. If he decides to get mean, he's got all kinds of ways to do it and there's no one going to tell him stop. And so he begins to add pressure upon pressure, abuse upon abuse on this people. And of course, the people have the choice to respond. The people who heard the plan, the people who heard the rejoice and said yes and began to worship God, they began to say, yes, we love this plan. We think this is great. Come and redeem us. Now shift at the end of chapter 5 to complaint and accusation. You see, they hadn't thought through what it would cost to be redeemed. Wait, 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 God. You said we were leaving Egypt. I packed. You're not making us feel good about ourselves here. This is, this is, no, no, no. I, I, this, is, this isn't what we planned for. And wait a minute. You said you were going to show up, but you haven't shown up. Do you know what time it is? Do you know how long we've been here? Come on, God, we've got an agenda. You said you were finally going to show up and do something. Do it. Lord, you said that you would heal us. Where's my healing? God, you said that you would provide for us. I still got bills. God, you said, when do you show up? There's absolutely no modern parallel for that. I don't even know why I brought it up. That was sarcasm. We look at what God has told us as the plan, but if he's not doing it according to our plan, we wonder about his plan. We see that demonstrated in these people caught in the pressure of the world. And guys, that's really the point this morning. We are people caught between God's promises and our world's unbelief. It's not God that put the pressure on the Israelites. It was Pharaoh. God is in the process of redeeming and restoring his people. And an evil, sick world around is responding to that and abusing the children of the Most High God because he's redeeming them. And they don't want that. We battle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6 and 12. You see, friends, the more we grow in our relationship to God, the closer we know Him, the closer we grow in our knowledge of Him, the more the world hates us. Following God in a fallen world is never going to be easy. Jesus even says in John chapter 16 and verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you have, may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I've got a plan, and that plan will redeem you, and that plan will restore you, and that plan will heal you, and that plan will take you to places you have never imagined, and that plan will take you into my absolute holiness. You will be made righteous. You will be restored to everything you were ever made to be. But between now and then, life's going to be tough. I tell you this, so you'll have peace. Peace! My body hurts. Yeah, it does. And you have pain relief. You have pain management. How many people in generations before us had pain with nothing? That doesn't excuse it. That doesn't justify it. I'm not trying to be frivolous. I'm not trying to be... If you cut my arm off, I can live without an arm, even if it hurts. If you take my vision, 
I can still see even though my eyes don't work. God can still provide life if he takes everything else away. But let's remember, it's not God taking it away. My body hurts. Why doesn't God do something? He is doing something. He is restoring. He is redeeming. He is giving strength. He is giving endurance. He is walking through this with you. But why do I have leukemia? Because I live in a sin-sick, fallen world and they burn stuff in Iraq and I breathed it, okay? I live in a fallen world. The cancer wasn't a gift of God. It was a gift of the sin of myself and my fellow man. Death isn't God's idea, it's ours. Pain isn't God's idea, it's ours. And we have to recognize that God is doing what He promised and what He has planned all along but our neighbors and us are doing everything we can to mess it up just as quick as he can fix it. You see, God has a plan. You realize that you're saved, but not yet? I, I know that sounds weird coming out of a preacher, but, but do you realize that you're not yet saved? I mean, how many of you are believers in Jesus Christ and you know full well that you have given your life to Christ? Amen? You are saved. You know you have eternity. Your sins have been forgiven. You have repented and He has been faithful and just to forgive your sins. How many of your bodies still hurt? How many of your finances still hurt? How many of your families still hurt? How many of your... We're saved, but not yet. You see, there's a level of redemption that has not yet come. I don't know about you. I'm just going to talk about me. I still struggle with sin. Every single day, I am learning to lean. I can totally get what Paul was lamenting in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. For I know that good in itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Thank you, Paul, for putting into words what we all think. We struggle with sin. I'm saved. If I've been redeemed, why do I still act like this? Because I'm redeemed, but not yet. God's still working on us. Just like Moses was chosen to lead those people, even though he was all messed up, and God will spend the next 40 years fixing the people, he will also spend the next 40 years fixing Moses and growing him and developing him because he has a plan to teach us and to grow us. We still struggle with difficulties. We still live in a broken world. Hebrews reminds us that faith is the evidence of things not seen. The assurance of what we don't yet have. We just have to trust God. And that's a tough lesson to learn. You know, if, if you were to ask me what's the meaning of life, I would probably answer learning to trust God. In my 51 years now of life, I can tell you that the thing that I have run into more and more and more and more and more is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? You trust me over here. Are you going to trust me here? Are you going to trust me there? Because if there's an area I don't trust him in, do I really trust him? You know, if I trust you to do this and I trust you to do that, but I don't really trust you to do this thing over here, do I really trust you? And we need to be clear in that, friends. As, as we start to help people to find redemption in Jesus Christ, we need to be honest salespersons. And I don't mean we're selling Jesus, but you know that you're going out there telling people about God. Can we please, for the love of God and the love of those people, be honest that when you subject yourself to redemption, when you submit your life to Christ, when you give Him all that you are and receive from Him that salvation, things are going to get better, but they are going to get worse first. 
Let's just be honest. None of us got saved and instantly had enough money in the bank. None of us got saved and were instantly delivered from something. Well, some people do get that, but most of us don't. Most of us still continue to struggle. You know, it's kind of like a bunch of Israelites in Egyptian slavery. God says, I'm going to redeem you. And they said, yes, I'll take it. And suddenly they didn't have any straw for their bricks. It got harder before they got better. Why? Not because of what God was doing in their life, but because of the enemy of God who begins to now work in that life. You see, while the Israelites were being delivered, the old masters tried to set on them and keeping them from escaping. Just like when God starts working in our life, our old slave master sin and its puppet God Satan start to put pressure on us to keep us under that thumb. Same quota, but now no straw. There's a lot of ways to find yourself in Satan's crosshairs. Yeah, yeah, you know, something that you have to keep in mind. When we're lost, when we're unsaved, when we're just floating around out there in the world doing the best we know how to do, we cost Satan absolutely nothing. He's already got us. We already work for him. We're already slaves. And largely, he will either ignore us or from time to time will play with us like a bug on a string. But most of the time, Satan doesn't care about us. Oh, but once we commit to Christ, we get Satan's attention. Because now he has a slave trying to run away. But we are no longer slaves to sin. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. But that doesn't mean that Satan's not going to try to put us back under that thumb. You see, he doesn't want to lose us to God. He doesn't care about you. Satan does not want you for you. Satan is not your buddy. Satan is not going to take care of you. Satan just wants to deprive God of you. You see, to Satan, you are a pawn. And once we commit to discipleship, it gets even worse. And once we actually apply the truths of Scripture to our daily life and decisions, and we become active for the kingdom, and we start doing what God asks us to do, it gets a lot of attention. I was standing over here this morning adjusting the air conditioner before we got started and the praise team was praising. Let me just say it wasn't working. And then that thing quit. And, and that's the conversation Rudy was referencing because I stepped stood up here and, and we looked at each other and said, you know, some of the best church I've ever had was under a tent sitting on a hay bale. And those of you who are old enough to remember the old brush arbors know exactly what I'm talking about. We don't need all this. But we've become comfortable with it. And so if Satan can take that thing away so that the praise team can kind of stumble on the word and the pianist is having trouble to figure out exactly where things are, then you might get distracted and stop worshiping. You see, every one of those things I see as spiritual warfare. Not because I'm some sort of spiritist, but because I'm told that we do not battle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, and the authorities of the spiritual realm who are trying to do anything they can to keep us from Christ. And if he can keep us out by taking out a machine, he's going to do it. If he can do something by making the wheel fall off of your car, he's going to do it. If he can get your attention by making your kids sick, he's going to do it. He's, if he can get you messed up because you've got a pain in your body, he's going to do it. If he can get you distracted from God, he wins. So that's the world we live in. You see, God's plan is eternal not temporal. 
This world was screwed up when we got here. It'll probably be still messed up when we leave. Our time on this earth is just part of a bigger plan. And that bigger plan is the redemption of all mankind, not just you. Peter reminds us that God is taking his own sweet time because he knows who the last person to get saved is. And he's waiting for that person, just like he waited for Moses to be in a position to redeem the people of Israel. So he is waiting for the last person to come to him that will in human history and then we all get to go home some of us will die and go home before that happens praise god for that too praise god for the gift of human death who would want to live eternally this messed up praise god he gives us an out Praise God this body fails. Praise God I don't have to keep living in this world past the last moment God wants me here. And when he graduates me home, I will celebrate. And until he takes me home, I don't care if every cell in my body explodes one by one from the toes up. I will still praise his name. I don't care what you do to my body. You can't kill my spirit. You can't hurt me, Satan, bad enough for me to neglect my God. We've got to have that warrior's mindset. We've got to have that understanding that we have been given a hope. Just as Moses came to the Israelites, Jesus Christ came to earth to save and to redeem. And we want it to happen in our time. And we want it to look like we want it to look. But it's not our plan. And the fact of the matter is, this whole book tells us over and over and over, it's going to hurt because my enemy is attacking you and I will bring you through it. I will take every evil that he does and I will turn it for good for those who love me and are called according to my purpose. And we are. We are the people who will walk out of this place and enjoy the presence of God for all eternity. But right now we're still under bondage in a sin-sick fallen world. And the pressure that we're under, God didn't give us. God's redeeming us. God's with us. God's healing us. All that we endure today will be made right in the end. But I want to be honest with you, it still hurts now. Claim God in the good and praise Him. Trust God in the bad. He will get you through it. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. The plan that He has for you is for a hope and a future. He will give you the grace to endure whatever you'll face between here and the finish line. As I go to prayer, I give you an old hymn. And I pray that it sticks in your head and drives you crazy the rest of the week. Because songs stick in my head and drive me crazy all the time. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Heavenly Father, we are a people who feel like our straw has been stolen. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would use this lesson from Exodus to remind us not to stand in your face and scream, where are you? Not to throw rocks at those that you've sent to teach us and to guide us out of this but to receive your plan on day 57 the same way we did on day one with praise and rejoicing, knowing that you are faithful to do exactly what you've said you're going to do. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every one of our hearts this morning. I pray that you would make yourself real in such an incredible way that we would know you, that we would depend on you, that we would trust you. Lord, show us in our rearview mirrors every single place you have been faithful. Show us, Lord God, how what the world calls consequence you call providence. I ask, Lord God, that you would calm our hearts, settle our fears. Teach us in all of our anxiety to bring our thoughts to You in prayer and petition and thanksgiving. Lord, as we see the totality of Scripture laid out before us, help us to remember that Your plan is the plan and it's the best plan. And that while we might want something different for ourselves, that might deny a whole host of others a benefit and a blessing that we don't understand. Help us to remember, Lord, to seek first Your kingdom and Your righteousness, knowing that all these other things will be added as well. And we'll give You glory for it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Stand with me, please. We serve a wonderful Savior. And all are here for one by one, by one reason only, God's amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and fears. I have already found this grace brought me safe thus far, and His grace will lead me home. You guys are smarter than I am, because you wouldn't do what I did this week. You ever have one of those moments where you find yourself doing something and you're like, this was dumb. <laughs> Walked out of my house a few days ago, barefoot, 
my kick around the house shorts. Walked up my gravel road about a half mile. Got about a half mile and what was going on in my head finally cleared. And I found myself a half mile from my house on a gravel road, barefoot. And I wasn't sure they weren't already bleeding and realized, oh wait, I still have to walk home. Now, thankfully, I grew up in the California desert walking in the sand and the gravel a lot, and I got pretty tough feet. But I can tell you that by the time I got back to the house, I was really, really happy to be back at the house. <laughs> got my body into a tub, and I let my feet soak. They still hurt. This morning, I almost used the stool. It still hurt. This morning, you might find yourself halfway home and your body and your spirit ache. I give you the promise of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Finish the walk for there will be a reception at the house beyond anything you have ever hoped or imagined. Keep Amen walking.